All right, go ahead and get started, Good. Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, name is Scott Sable. Like, like Eric said, I'm up in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, Canada. My presentation is going to be uh, managing rail cars in a classification yard. Um, I use JMRI ops for my car forwarding. And I use tab on cars just in my yards just to keep it straight and help out the yard crews organize their yards a little easier. Uh, one thing about a switch list program is that um, kind of to keep track of cars in the yard is difficult because it's so fluid and cars are coming and going from different tracks and all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about. So just a quick outline. I'm going to just give you a quick overview of my layout, just to show you where my yards are and stuff like that. I'm going to get a quick overview of my grand cash yard. I'm going to use that yard as my demonstration as I go through some of the slides and uh, got a couple of videos here that hopefully work okay on Zoom. I've tested it so far so good. Uh, I'm going to talk about the method I use, which is the tab on car. I'm going to talk about the prototype. The prototype does something somewhat same as the way we're doing the tab on cars here, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'll go through some scenarios about managing the cars in the yards, so blocking cars, classifying incoming cars, stuff like that. Um, use with car cards. Um, since I'm using a switch list program, I thought I'd also throw in a quick little slide here to see if something like this might be suitable for car cards, although it's not really necessary because the cards themselves and their pockets usually help out with that kind of uh, organization. Uh, we'll talk about pros and cons. So like every system has pros and cons. And then at the end, we've got the questions if there's any questions and stuff like that. So. Um, the, the, my railroads this is a class two. I've kind of freelanced everything based on Canadian National Rail, Railways, and I um, I operate in the summer in '77. Uh, it's a N scale, um, a 13 by 14 foot room. It's a small layout, so I usually have about five or six operators in the room at a time. 100 feet of mainline track. Uh, I built it for operations. I like operations like the switching, um, the dispatching, that stuff, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, lots of switching, 250 cars on the layout uh, that get moved around in the session. And like I said, I use JMRI ops for car forwarding. Uh, there's the layout room. And later on, we'll be talking about this yard down here, which as we use for the examples. So here's the schematic. I've got two classification yards. I've got Grand Cache in the east, and I got a Colton classification yard in the west. Uh, Grand caches, like I said, will be the example. I've also got a, a storage yard in uh, for storing empty cars. I did an op, uh, I did an article in Opsig magazine in April 2017 how I utilized that yard and how I was able to kind of uh, work with it and kind of ease the tension or ease the congestion of some of the other yards as well as moving empty cars off. Uh, here's the, here's the track plan. Um, what I've got is there's my Grand Cash yard at the bottom. Colton's up top, it's a higher elevation, and then the welding yard over here. Um, the Grand Cache yard, uh, basically I've got six classification tracks in it, one caboose track. I have a dedicated arrival departure track. When you get into yard design and all that, they recommend for model railroads to have a dedicated arrival and departure track. That gets the mainline trains out and away from the yard crew doing switching and helps the yard crew be more efficient. Um, this uh, yard has about 280 or two, tw yeah, 2,840 feet of track, which is about 64 cars. And during a session, we've got 17 trains coming in out of the yard and roughly about 70 cars in and 70 cars out. So this is a very busy yard and we pretty much use all the trackage in it. Um, right now, I've got one person that can handle the yard master yard crew with this system, uh, depending on, of course, on experience. Um, when I first started off with GMRI, basically it took two people to operate this yard a yard master and a crew just to keep pace with everything else that was going on. Uh, here's a quick diagram of the yard. Uh, the orange is going to be your classification tracks with my switch lead off to the off to the uh, left there. Um, I've also got a couple industries in black uh, that the yard crew is also responsible for switching during the session as well. And um, engine terminal, of course, and then main and sidings. And you can see my arrival departure track is set up here right off the uh, pink siding track. Next thing. So um, typical classification yard track labeling. There's always a track diagram that always goes with basically every yard I've ever worked on. Um, I've also, when I started off with JMRI, I actually put labels on my tracks. Um, 
for the reason of classifying cars. Um, it got a little bit uh, restrictive because I've got six classification tracks, but I've got nine trains going in and out of this yard. So what happens is you have to double over on uh, some of the uses of the trackage and I'll explain later on how my system, how the system works to help that. Um, I also belong with the Edmonton Railway Club here. Uh, we use car cards in um, far layout for car forwarding. And what we have is a, a couple big yards. We've got a Vernon yard, which is 11 tracks. And we have the car cards in the pockets, but we also use uh, these uh, binder clips, which are basically um, clips we can put onto the different tracks. And so the destinations that these cars are going will change based on the fluidity of the yard. Uh, Castle guards are out of the yard, which is uh, at the lower level, small yards. Uh, the uh, yard crews use just a little whiteboard to keep track of what cars are, what destinations are on what tracks. And it works quite well. Again, the car cards help out with uh, exactly telling you what cars are on what track. So what I use is I'm using the um, tab on car system. So the cars in my yard have a small little tab on top that tells the destination of the car. And the destination is going by either by train, like away freight or to certain towns and certain areas on the layout. Like I said earlier is I started off with labels on my tracks and um, ran into some problems. Uh, during an operating session, Kel Sexsmith was mentioned to me that some people use a uh, tab on car in the yards to help alleviate the, 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 the confusion what's going on. So thanks, Kel. Um, for those of you who are wondering why, what the heck I'm doing, putting little tabs on my cars and all that kind of stuff and how unprototypical it is, you guys can blame Kel for this presentation, but I'd like to thank Kel for this presentation. Um, but before we pass judgment, I wanna talk about um, route cards and chalk marks. Okay, so this is prototype railroads. Um, when the train came into a yard, the yard clerks would usually get the bills, the way bills and all that kind of stuff. They would go through, check out the way bills. And then this is a picture of a yard clerk going by and he's putting a route card on the side of that car. Now the route card is gonna tell the switchman in the yard where the destination of this car so they can properly classify it, whether it's going to an industrial zone or a classification track. Uh, this is the text and the pictures provided by Tony Thompson. Um, he's got a great blog um, on the uh, Southern Pacific, and he's got about 16 pages in his blog about talking about root cards, and found it quite informative. So I'd like to thank Tony for um, supplying that. Um, here's another thing from Tony's website. These are prototypical root cards. So these would be the cards that are stapled onto the, to the tack boards on the side of the cars. Uh, they're very they're different and all that kind of stuff. Um, with the information, they'll have on this case here, they'll have a destination like Fullerton. Some of them were pre-printed, okay? They would have car numbers and all that. Um, again, uh, I would like to thank Tony again for providing this information. And there's a link to his, uh, his uh, Southern Pacific blog, which has got lots of information on the prototypical stuff. Um, next slide. So just finally for root cards and chalk marks, there's some other references is, um, on YouTube, there's a, there's a video called Train 406. Uh, it's about a fast freight from Toronto, Montreal, 30 minutes. But in that, at about the, the, the 17 minute mark, they actually show a car clerk going down a line of car, incoming cars and actually stapling on the car cards to where the cars are going and explaining what he's doing. Uh, there's another website where they talk about chalk marks. So chalk marks did the same thing. Uh, again, with the chalk marks, the uh, switchmen knew where to route the, route the cars. Um, also, in the uh, OPSIG Dispatchers magazine on uh, back in July 2020, Eric Heiser's article was on agency and yard operations on the uh, uh, ATSF. Uh, the interesting thing is one of the, I just took one of the sentences out of the paragraphs here, it says, when the review of the way bills was complete, the yard click would go into the yard and nail the cars, the car cards to the cars. So with the tab on car, we're doing very similar to what they're doing with root cards. There we go. So, of course, just for a little bit of humor, I tried doing it like the, like the big boys did. Uh, I got this staple. It's my three bears approach to doing model railroading. One was too big. Obviously, uh, trying to use the actual tack board was too small. So I settled on basically a tab on top of the car, mostly because when you got a yard, a, tr uh, a track full of cars, you can see the roofs a lot easier. You can't see the sides. So what we do is we put the, the, um, the tabs on top. So making the tabs is pretty simple. Just um, use some evergreen channel, a label maker, 
Um, what I'm using is I have a three letter character for my destinations. I'll explain that in a minute here. Uh, pretty simple to do. Um, little pill bottle box at the bottom so that you can sort them so that um, they're easy to find and all grouped together. So now I'll just talk a little bit about managing how this system works in the yard. I'm going to quickly talk about a yard lineup and my GMRI switch list. I'm going to have a description and a, and a way of a little video about blocking outgoing cars. So GMRI will show you the blocking order in their switch list. Okay, uh, I got a little video on classifying incoming cars. They're about two, these videos are about three minutes long. Uh, the flexibility of the system, uh, keeping track of cars in the yard. And then I got a couple extra special cases I've added as well. So is that is that window in the way at the top, guys? I'm trying to see here. I'm sorry, say that. again, Scott. Okay, I got that uh, the, the chat window at the top, you know, where the mute and the screen is and all that. Do you guys see that or you guys just see the whole white screen? I see, well, I mean, in my case, I've got the participants in the chat window to the right. Yep. I've got people up on the top, and then I've got your whole screen here. Oh, good. Yeah, because I've got the sharing window drop down when I'm sharing, and I wasn't sure. Oh, if okay. Okay, but you guys don't no, see I can see every, I can see everything from the railroad header or grand oh, backyard lineup all the way down to NFM 271E. Ah, so. perfect. Okay, great. So on the left hand side is my lineup for my uh, my cars coming in and out of the Grand Cash Yard. Um, down in the middle of it is the pink area, and that tells the yard crews what cars, what cars are destined for going out with that train. On the right hand side is basically my three letter designation and kind of where the cars are going. Um, the thing is, I've got nine destinations here, and I've only got six yard tracks. So, you know, as throughout the progression of the session, cars get moved around from track to track. Um, at the bottom, I've got some empty ore cars that travel in a group of 10. I don't bother labeling those because those are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and but everything else, the uh, the GC GCY down to the SMT here, are all labeled. Um, later on in the presentation, I'm going to do an example of this train CN 815 coming into the yard, dropping off and picking up cars, and then what the yard crew needs to do to get everything ready for that train. So this is my GMR yard setup. Um, it's set up as a classification, like we got here. And the names of the classifications, these names basically match what my tags are. Okay, so there's no mention of what track or anything. It's just that this, these are groups of cars. Um, like this classification, there's restrictions on what trains can drop off and pick up to each track. Also, GMRI has a pooling function where you can pool tracks together, and the program will share the, yard, the, the footage of those tracks between these tracks. And that helps a little bit of flexibility. I'll show how that works later on. So, GMRI switch lists. Okay, so GMRI produces two types of switch lists when you build a train. One switch list, they actually call a manifest here. And the manifest is given to the road crews. So this is the manifest. Oops. This is the manifest for train 815. And these are the cars, the cars it'll start up with on the start. It does some switching and then the cars it'll drop up at the end. So that goes with, I guess, the road crew. The other switch list that JMRI uh, produces at the same time, they actually call it a switch list. These are actually based on location. So this here is a switch list for Grand Cash Yard. So every location, if you wanted to, you have the option of turning these off and on, will have basically just the cars being switched in and out of that location for every train that stops there. So this happens to be a page for train 815. So the yard crew will have the same information as the manifest crew does. So there's the information again, Talk about what the train crew is doing at Grand Cash Yard. And then that matches the information from here for the yard crew. So the yard crew can actually, they know what, what cars are being lifted, taken by train 814 or 815, and what cars are being dropped off by train 815. So we'll talk about that in some detail here. So this is the bottom of the switch list we just showed. And this is the cars that are going to be being blocked. The yard crew needs to block for 815. The other thing it adds is it tells you where these cars are coming from. 
So since this is a classification yard, these cars are coming from the CN group of cars. So the yard crews know what, what cars to get. The other thing that JMRI does is this is also the blocking order that the cars need to be in for that train to pick up. Now, if it's going to the same destination, it's not that important, but if you got a way freight or you got other train that's going through and it's got different, de de or different destinations, the um, switch list will be in the order of towns or in whatever order you, you can actually manipulate the order you want that the yard crew knows how to block these cars. So I've got a video here. It's a little choppy at the beginning, but this is a little three minute video that shows the blocking, uh, pulling the cars from the track and blocking these specific, these uh, six cars. Just, uh, and no, there's no sound or anything. So Eric, if things aren't coming through very well, let me know. So what's happening, I forgot to mention, I've also got another set of tabs that are numbered one through whatever. And uh, we're emulating what a switchman would be doing as, as, as the engine's pulling the cars. The switchman will be writing down what uh, order they need to go in. And we're just putting those, those numbers on top of the cars. Okay, so that was the train crew going working off the switch list, getting those cars ready for 815 to pick up. So now on the top of this um, switch list that the, that the crew has, is these are the cars that 815 will be dropping off. And on it will be the destinations that the crew would have to tag these cars now with uh, to sort it out in the yard. So we've got a little video. We've got the video here showing the train coming in, exchanging the pickups for the drop-offs and then the train, the yard crew going through and um, sorting them. Again, the video is a little choppy at the beginning for some reason, but it smooths out.
Okay, so um, the air crew just finished sorting the cars, and it's just a matter of you had to throw them in your hand the whole time. And you're just matching up the same tags. A couple of things I want to point out, though, is that these two box cars here, the two CP cars, they're actually on a different track. They belong in the cars on track five, which are all the same GCY cars, but this track was full. So what happens is they end up putting them on track four instead, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this one car here, this car was labeled for SMT, which is a turn. There's no other cars of that same tag in the yard. So they're just going to put that separate, just put that car there uh, temporarily until some other cars come up. But uh, what we'll do is we'll talk about the two CP box cars. Um, this is where the program kind of helps you out, keeping things organized in your mind and on the layout. Um, GMRI offers track pooling, like I mentioned earlier. And what it is, it's like a, a Rob Peter to pay Paul thing with length of track. So if we take a look at a typical yard um, trackage, ladder trackage, now you got all the lengths of each track down there and you can see towards the bottom, the, the lengths get shorter and there's a total length of uh, 2,300 feet. You put all these tracks, these, these uh, five tracks into a pool, GMRI will share unused footage of tracks. So let's say GMRI says, okay, the purple car is there. It's only got uh, 450 feet of track, but it wants to add three more cars because there's got Scott car to that destination. It'll borrow 150 feet from the track at the bottom which is the way feet track, way, way freight track. So it kind of treats it like elastic bands. Now, of course, we can't do that in the mall railroad. So the yard crew will need to put those extra three cars somewhere else. And this is where sharing cars on the same track with the tags on top is very easy to keep track of these, especially for situations like this. So here's an example here on uh, track T1, it's full of CN cars. The CN cars are been overflowed onto track two with the way freight cars. And you can see the other cars there. So this is a way of keeping track of stuff like that, where the cars, we got to find room to put cars. Um, the other thing is that SMT car was resolved by itself in the yard. Um, there's also this thing called a slough track or cars we switch later that go off later on in the session. Um, like I said, I've got nine trains going out, but only six tracks. So I've got to share tracks somehow. So if you take a look at the cars at the bottom here, the GCC cars, CLY and SMT, at the beginning of the session, these cars, you know, really, really, they don't go out until later on in the afternoon or the evening. So the yard crew does not need to worry about them right away. So there's really no problem with the yard crew taking those cars and just kind of throwing them onto any track. And once the other trains leave and those tracks become free, he can easily take those cars out, sort them at his time. Again, it's very easy. Everything's right in front of him. He doesn't have to look down elsewhere. He sees it almost like a, a checkerboard or a chessboard. Um, the other couple special cases I use is... Um, lost cars sometimes. Um, so I do end scale. And the nice thing about the JMRI switch list and manifest is you can organize the order, what's presented on the list, add more detail, take away less detail, um, and customize it yourself. What I prefer to do is, since it's end scale, is just to help the guys out, is I always have the type of car first in the list, the length, and then the color, because it's a lot easier to spot a green box car it uh, just speeds up the whole process of going through the switch list and finding the cars. Uh, next would be the road name. And then finally would be the road number. Um, again, with n -scale, not it doesn't happen often, but a lot of times it'll happen where the wrong car will come in. So this is car 1500 instead of 1538, which is identical except for the number. So what I've got is I have a lost car form we fill out. And then all we do is we tag that car with an orange uh, piece of channel. Uh, yard crews know they don't have to worry about it. And later on, either during the session or even afterwards, I'll go and sort everything out and find the way the proper location and fix it. The other thing is bad order cars. Um, usually when cars come into the yard, they're checked for um, defects and uh, they're tagged with a bad order on the tack board, same as where the root cards would be. In that same um, train 406 video, they show a fellow doing that. He's checking the journal boxes, he's checking the wheel profile, then he puts a bad order card onto the side. So I'm doing that just with a blue tag. So if they go through a bad order, we put a blue tag on the top of the car. Um, we fill out the, a blue piece of paper and then the yard crew knows to take that over to the rip track. And later on, after a certain amount of time, we'll get that all fixed up and it goes back into the yard to where it's supposed to be. So basically, like I said, is um, I use GMRI and what I find with most switch list programs to keep track of stuff in the yards and make things more efficient for the crews, yeah, this system works very well for me. It's very simple to use. Uh, people that come and uh, operate for 
uh, operating sessions and stuff like that the first time, they, they pick it up rather quickly, rather easily. Um, this is not necessarily useful with uh, car cards. Uh, you got the pockets, you got the destinations. Uh, you can easily keep track of the cars in the yard with the cars in the pockets. Um, it may not be beneficial for a one person yard because they're typically smaller yards. Um, it's easy to keep track of all that. There's not too many cars in that. Um, it may be beneficial for larger yards with two or three or four or more people. Um, again, you have, um, I've been to a couple layouts where I was basically the switching crew looking after switching the cards. And there was, in one place, there was three people, yard master and a yard clerk. And the other one was a person acted as yard clerk and yard master. So what happens was when a train came in, the conductor would give the waybills to the yard clerk. Then he would go off to his desk, sort the yard, sort all the cards up. He would hand write out a switch list, and then he would hand it to me as a switching crew, and I would switch the cars out into the yard based on his switch list. And vice versa, when cars were ready to go out, um, he would assemble the cart, all the cart cards. He would hand write out a switch list for me, and I would then assemble the train according to the switch list. So using the tabs like this in a car card situation, it may be a little easier than writing out the switch list. Um, you can be like the yard card, you just tag the cards. Um, your card, you still have cards and card pockets, but you can have them for destinations and you don't need to worry about tracks. Tracks can sort themselves out. Um, I've also seen this approach when cars come in. People would put the car cards up against the cards and make sure they're all there. Um, the tagging, you know, would be the, kind of the same thing. You're checking the trains as they come through to make sure the car cards match what's actually in the train. Uh, typically, exactly what a yard clerk would do in the prototype. Um, finally, it's got some pros and cons of the system, like with everything. Um, one of the pros is switching goes faster. Now, faster is kind of subjective on this. Um, when I'm switching cars in the yard, um, and the reason I kind of said faster is that typically what I'll do is I'll look at the paperwork of my cars to classify, uh, whether, whether it's a switch list or car card, and I'll look at the first three or four cards, I'll put the paperwork down, I'll then pick up my throttle, and then I would use my throttle to switch those four cars put the throttle down, pick up the paperwork again, look at the next four and pick up, the, put it down, pick up the throttle. Here, when you, once you tag the cars, you've just got the throttle in your hand. You can follow the cards away later, later and you just run the throttle. So I find, I think that's, that's the reason I'm saying faster. Um, you can easily see the destinations of the cars in the yard. It's just all right down in front of you, like, like I said, a checkerboard or a chessboard. There's not cars off in a pocket somewhere you have to go through or switch list that you've got handwritten things on what's on what track. Um, Better track utilization, you can share tracks. Um, if a track is, uh, if you've got a long track that's empty or emptier, you can move uh, uh, more cars to that track or even take a whole bunch of cars and move them up to a longer track if you're getting ready to classify. Um, trains aren't limited to track length. Um, like a ladder track, uh, typically what I did before is each track was assigned to a train and it was, the train length was combined to how many cars I can get in that particular classification track. So here we don't have to worry about that. Um, allows yard crews for more freedom of organizing rail cars. Um, my way was one way. Uh, another suggested way is uh, if you've got trains A and B that are going out one after another, you can put all the A and B cars together. When you pull out the A cars and block them, then you've got the B cars left. So it's entirely up to yard crews what tracks they want to use and where they want to put their cars. Uh, cons, aesthetics. Yeah, I agree. A lot of people don't like the little tabs on top of cars, and that's totally understandable. A little finicky um, when used on end scale cars. You've got to be light touch and all that kind of stuff because you're constantly touching the cars. Um, cardio element, um, the tabs fall off, of course. Um, at our club at EMRA, I've been, I like doing the yard work and uh, we use car cards and we run 35 car trains. And as a yard master, I've uh, picked up a good stack of car cards and conveniently dropped them on the floor just as the train was coming in. So that tend, tended to slow down the classifications quite a bit. So um, again, um, there's, like I said, pros and cons for everything. Um, and it's um, basically that's all. And thanks for watching. What did I do for time there, Eric? Oh, just, just fine. And appreciate the link to operating sessions.com. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought I'd put that in for some points. Oh, yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions in the in the chat. What software did you use for your schematics or your great schematics? I'm sorry. Oh, um, I'm a piping designer, so I've got, I use AutoCAD. Okay. And then uh, converted it to yeah, Adobe. 
let's say, how are you uncoupling the cars using picks or? Oh, in the videos? Yeah, I got a, I got a small flashlight with okay. a, a brass pick on the end. Yep, all manual. All right. Um, let's say, there was a question about how do you decide that a car is defective? Um, I mean, there, there's the obvious thing as well, the coupler broke, the, you know, some sort mm -hmm. of mechanical thing but is there some sort of a random like somebody suggests i have a car card saying the third car in train 908 to set off for repair are you doing mm -hmm. anything like that too yeah. i'm doing a roll of a dice you know okay. you, when you would you roll a dice that says you know if you roll double ones you got to detect card and roll dice again and, and it's the 10th car or something i'd leave it totally up to chance all right um how long did it take you to set up your system uh, the GMRI system or the cart or the tabs? Uh, it just says, how long did you take to set up your system? Oh, okay. Well, I've been doing GMRI for about 10 years. Um, to set it up the first time, you know, it's probably, it takes you a bit of thinking of how you want to do it and all that. It's, it's an evolving process. And the nice thing about GMRI is that it evolves with you. You can, it's easily malleable to, as you start doing different things. Like I said, I started off with doing tracks and in JMRI, for instance, I would have uh, CLY track and, C and wave track. Well, when I went to the tabs, I just modified JMRI just to take off the word track. I didn't have to do any bunch of re, uh, reinventing or anything. So it's, it doesn't, it depends how complicated things are, but the nice thing is, is you learn as you go and everything kind of moves with you, it evolves with you. And then uh, have you considered color coding the destinations on the tabs? I, I have, and some people, um, Mark Dance, who presented earlier, um, he does N scale, and he's actually got a good video on YouTube. He uses color tabs throughout the whole thing. Yeah. The reason I didn't do color is because of the switch list printing out. I print out my switch lists in black and white. I use all paper copies, and no sense putting. I, I, I didn't want to put a color there, and you can't get a color print out of Jammer. Well, you, you could, but not for the destinations. Yeah. Yeah. Mark also has that great, um, uh, really modeling the. The work involved in the uh, in the shops. Uh, yes, he was one of the first uh, the first folks who presented with us, and that was quite the quite the system. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question: Can you comment on our overhead lighting for the layout type of lights, location of fixtures? Oh, uh, so those are LED bulbs. Okay. Uh, um, I used to have halogens in there. And um, you all warm. <laughs> oh, you got really warm. And the funny thing was, is when you get ten, uh, get five guys in there in halogens, Oof. and my wife has been wanting air conditioning for all these years, and I've been pushing back. Once that happened, I said, "Yeah, hey, let's get air conditioning." Yeah. But uh, yeah. but but the LEDs I put in twice as much light for a third of the wattage, maybe or a quarter of the wattage. Yep. They're they're worth the money. Yeah. The uh, the LED strip LED strips I'm using they're 18 feet long. Mm -hmm. They're insanely bright. And each strip is like, I think it's either 50 or 60 watts. Yeah. I mean, it's like one bulb and I've got the entire, you know, entire side of the layout lit up. Yeah. So, yeah. so okay. I, was, I, was using, I was using 50 watt halogens and now I'm replacing with nine watt LEDs. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's so much nicer. Mm -hmm. um, so Scott, again, thanks for presenting again. We appreciate that. My uh, pleasure. Go ahead and turn off your spotlight and find Doug. Hey, Doug, you on? <laughs> and we're going to unmute you. OK, go ahead, Doug. OK, can everyone hear me? Well, yeah, you, we can hear you fine. OK, great. Uh, well, Scott, I just want to say a uh, nice presentation. And next time I'm operating a yard too fast, I'll just refer to your presentation and uh, blame it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doug, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell, okay. us, tell us what you've been doing. Sure. Uh, my name's Doug Akromis. I live in Windsor, Colorado, moved here from Cleveland about five years ago and have uh, really gotten into operations based on uh, some of the nice layouts out in this area. And I'm in the process of building my layout, as you can see in the background. Uh, it's uh, it's an opportunity here where Eric had, had put out a call for papers. And I said, what the heck? I'll, I'll talk to Eric, see if he'd be interested in, in listening to my story. And I'm looking for feedback on how to operate prototypically. So he said, sure, that's a little different twist on what we normally do, but let's go for it. So, so here we are. 
So today I'm going to talk about uh, the Erie Lackawanna in 1968. I'm going to share my screen here, I think. I'll go back to my Zoom. Okay, I've never used Zoom before. I'm going to try this here. Share screen. There we go. So I just pick what I want to pick. Got it. And share. And I should probably. All right. So we can see your PowerPoint there. Yep. Just got to get the presentation going here. And this should do it, hopefully. Slideshow, come on. There we go. All right, looks good. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about the Erie Lackawanna Southern Tier Division today. Um, the Erie Lackawanna, if you don't know, was a merger between the Erie and the Lackawanna Railroads back in 1960. And uh, it's a railroad that I, I enjoy. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what is the layout? It's uh, HO. It's, an, it's the Erie Lackawanna Freelance. The theme is mainline freight, interchange, and industrial switching. Locale is Southern Pennsylvania, Manesson to York. It's a segment of the DLNW's fictional Chicago to Secaucus mainline. As I said earlier, it's the summer of 1968. Uh, the layout was originally designed as a, a double deck layout, but uh, Back in 2018, I think July, uh, there's an article in Model Railroader. Uh, Mike Tricker described adding a third level to his layout to get some additional operation in. And I started thinking about that and I'm um, thinking, well, I'm running across the Appalachians. Why not put a third deck on this and that'll be the run across the Appalachians? So it uh, turned out well. What it did is it extended my main run, my main line run by about 220 feet. So the, there's 440 feet of single track and there's 230 feet of double track, which includes a 90 foot helper district. Uh, maximum grade on that district is about 2.25%. The uh, minimum radius is 42 and it drops down to 40 on some sidings and in some areas on the, uh, on the double track main. Why the Erie Lackawanna? Um, growing up in Buffalo, I was probably four or five years old and my dad, every, uh, Day after Thanksgiving, we'd clear out the, uh, the living room, move all the furniture to one side, bring in two pieces of four by eight plywood, and he would build a line of layout that would last for about two to three years before my mom eventually said, enough, Jerry, let's, let's rip that thing down. But uh, he had steam locomotives. He had, the, he had F7s that were the uh, Santa Fe war bonnets. But for some reason, I was always attracted to this line of Lackawanna train master. Just loved that engine. Uh, Another reason is uh, E.L.'s Bison Yard in Buffalo. Uh, my dad's brother worked for the Erie, uh, which was then the E.L. by the time uh, I was born and, and coming around. But every once in a while, my dad would get a call on, on a Friday night saying, hey, Jerry, uh, I'm working tomorrow. If you want to bring Doug down to the yard, uh, we'll spend some time and uh, we'll hang out with the, the big boy trains. So as a kid, probably from about 6 to about 10 or 11, I had the opportunity to uh, get in the tower, watch trains being humped. Uh, get rides around the yard on switchers and things like that. And unfortunately, it, it ended early because my uncle passed away due to cancer at an early age. And uh, uh, it was a great opportunity why it existed, but uh, could have gone on for a lot longer time, unfortunately. So that's why I like the EL. Why 1968? Well, it all comes down to SD45s and GEU 33Cs. Um, the SD45s came out in 66, the 33s in 68. So uh, I love those larger diesels. Uh, and I, I had to pick 68 as my, as my year. So why freelance? Um, I think of freelancing as, as modeling flexibility while maintaining plausibility. I wanted to create a model railroad that maximizes operators' interest. Uh, the old saying, build it and they will come, isn't necessarily true. My specific prototype interest might not be of interest to you as an operator. Uh, so I always, uh, during operating sessions out here in Colorado, I would always be in the crew lounge and ask people when they came back from, from operating a train. So what do you operate? what do you like about it? What didn't you like? And so for three or four years, I was, I was typically polling all the operators and, and finding out what is it that people like about operating. And there's basically three groups. You got those who like to burn the main line, those who like to switch, and those who like to talk. <laughs> so I'm leaving the ones that talk out of this, uh, out of this operation in my basement, um, trying to at least. But uh, I'm looking at a diverse mainline operation uh, for those who want to burn the main. 
There's double track on the layout, single track junctions, sidings, meets, passes. There's priority trains, manifest trains, helpers, locals, trackage rights, interchange. And if those like to switch, I'm, I'm looking at plausible large industries like chemical industries, rubber industries, uh, tire making, appliance. Uh, it needs to be served by a variety of cars for some interesting switching. Uh, with freelancing, I can delay the DNLWA merger to 1964 uh, because of the you know, plausibility is the merger environment and the regulatory bodies of that time. This allows for a greater variety of paint schemes in 1968, and it also allows for those SD45s and U33Cs. Um, I can restencil those sharp looking two-tone maroon and gray cabooses from 1973 back to 1968. It's plausible they painted those cabooses five years earlier. Uh, also, I can build unique structures on the railroad that align with the prototype. Uh, I can do a stone or a concrete viaduct, but it doesn't have to be Struka. It doesn't have to be Tonkanak. It can be something else that I can name appropriately. So a lot of, a lot of things that I see as positive in freelancing, but I do want to maintain that prototype plausibility. Uh, the fictional line from uh, Secaucus to Chicago, starting from the east, uh, you can see in the... Uh, in the middle of the screen, you can see Lancaster, which is probably the last major yard on the, uh, on the EL before I reach my uh, modeled portion of York. And I continue west to the, the Pittsburgh area where New Stanton and uh, Manesson, and then finally going further west to the end of the screen to Wheeling. Moving on to the western side, uh, the line basically runs from Wheeling to Columbus, heads uh, northwest and uh, meets up with the uh, Erie in Decatur, Indiana, where it parallels the Erie all the way into Chicago. And uh, here's a picture of Griffith, Griffith, Indiana. And what's a few more diamonds if the, uh, if the DL and W came through there, huh? You know, it's a pretty interesting uh, trackage arrangement there. And there's a lot more diamonds in the background out of the picture you don't see. It was, it was quite an interesting location for uh, the track maintainers, I can bet. Okay, so the model section of the layout. Uh, starting from the, the west, I'm gonna have a traffic center or a, a mole, if you will, which represents Lancaster and Secaucus to the east. You enter the layout and the first town you hit is York, where I have industry and, and the interchange with the PRR. Going further west, you come to Chambersburg, which again is gonna be industry and now an interchange with Reading. Coming out of Chambersburg is a branch line, a short branch line, maybe 15 feet long that goes to Waynesboro. And this will again be industry and Western Maryland interchange. At that point, uh, we head uh, into the Appalachians, which is the third level of the layout. It, it uh, goes through a two turn helix. One of those turns will be a visible tunnel. The other one will be hidden. I try to keep as many uh, helices out of the layout. Uh, the original plan had 14 or 15, but I did uh, reduce the number of turns to only four on this layout, two up and two down. So once you get through the Appalachians, um, we're gonna get to the Western side of the layout where it gets a little bit more uh, interesting. On the West side, going back to the West side or the East side, I'm sorry, uh, locals will come out of Lancaster to service York and Chambersburg. And then there'll be a crew based in Waynesboro that probably heads into Chambersburg, picks up cars for, for Waynesboro and goes back to Waynesboro and, and does their work. But again, on the uh, west side, a lot more activity. Uh, we come into New Stanton. As you come out of the uh, Appalachians on the west, it's gonna be a small yard there, which basically classifies uh, cars for the Youngwood and South, South Greensburg local. There'll also be a Greensburg local coming out of New Stanton, as well as a train that goes uh, to the Trobe, which is basically just a staging area. There'll also be some industry in uh, New Stanton for that operator. New Stanton will be an operator position be a full-time operator, operator there throughout the uh, operating session. Uh, the next town is Monesson on the main line. And you see we have double track now instead of single track because there's a lot more activity in this, this area of the layout. There's also that, that uh, helper grade between Monesson and New Stanton. Uh, Monesson is the, uh, the lifeblood of the layout. It's the, the main classification yard. There'll be some industry there. There'll also be some uh, Western Maryland interchange coming out of Monesson is a branch line to Periopolis, which is staging. Uh, there'll be EL trains going in that direction and coming out of that, that uh, area, as well as Western Maryland coming out from Connellsville, trackage rights through Periopolis and up into Manesson Yard. Uh, going a little bit further west, the last town on the layout is Roscoe. This will be uh, basically industry. 
And then from there we go uh, westward back into the traffic center. Uh, it represents Pittsburgh, uh, Chicago and Wheeling on the, uh, the EL main line and also Morgantown. Here's a uh, footprint of the layout. And the third level is not uh, represented here because the third level again is the crossing of the Appalachians. It's basically three sidings spaced out on, on top of the, uh, on the third level. But here I've got the, uh, the two levels, the, uh, the or yellow level or, or dark yellow level is the first level of the layout. You can see Romanesson uh, wraps around the pool table area. It's about 70 feet long. It, like I said, it's the uh, lifeblood of the layout, a lot of activity in that area. You've got the Greensburg area across from it. Uh, to the right, you've got South Greensburg and Youngwood, which is, uh, as I said, another local. Then Roscoe at, at the uh, bottom of the uh, screen there. On the second level is New Stanton. You can see Chambersburg, Waynesboro, and York. And what I spent a lot of time in on this track plan is spacing out the industries so that operators weren't going to be in each other's way. And there are going to be some platforms to make switching the second level a little bit easier for those of us that are uh, vertically challenged. Uh, but I think I've done a decent job of keeping things spread out so that we don't have operators climbing over each other to work areas that are on one level and another level. Uh, the entrance to the layout from the crew lounge is a 60 inch uh, nod under. Coming from Anessa and the layout goes uh, east back to the nod under and it's basically like a, a Nolix. Uh, I had some helices in there previously and took those out. So again, that, uh, that one peninsula you see, there's, there's two turns up from the second to the third level to get to the Appalachians, and there's two turns coming down, both of them on the same uh, helix, if you will. It's, it's a double track helix, one going up, one going down. And then the traffic center is at the very bottom. That's where uh, trains will be basically repurposed through the old five finger movement. Uh, that's also tri-level trains will come in at the upper level and the lower level for into staging or arrival departure tracks. A uh, train can be brought up to the middle level or brought down to the middle level via the trackage. And at that point, uh, the, the one or two people in that traffic center will be reassigning cars to new classification tracks in the traffic center to create new trains for the various destinations on the layout. This is a uh, picture of the layout under construction. Um, Manesson would be on the lower level on the left, wrapping around the back of the pool table to where the, the ladder is. And you can see in some areas there's three levels. Uh, on the right, you see what, what it looks like two levels, but there's a third level that's gonna be going through a tunnel on the bottom. So you don't see a, a separate uh, set of bench work for that right there. But this is the, uh, the progress so far. I've got the bench work up. I've got all the uh, styrene back, backing up for the backdrop. And if you look at the top right hand uh, corner of the picture where the arrow is, I'm installing all of the balance framing right now to get the lighting balance up and in. So uh, we've got a ton of track and switches or turnouts in my basement, but I've been very uh, hesitant or very, uh, the willpower is very good to keep those in boxes until I get all of this construction work done and then start laying track. Uh, Manesson Yard. Uh, this is definitely the epicenter of operations. Uh, it is the main classification yard. It's a double track main line coming through because of the activity level again. It is a, uh, I've got three arrival departure tracks or set out pickup tracks. However, they're gonna be used by the yard crew. I've put my through track, the red track in the middle between the arrival departure and the classification tracks. This way, uh, any engines that are terminating or any trains terminating, the road power can get off of that train and get over to the engine servicing area without following up any of the work of the, uh, the yard switchers there. Then I've got uh, eight classification tracks, which are for the, basically the six of them are for the staging area, uh, Secaucus, Chicago, Wheeling, Morgantown, Pittsburgh, Lancaster. One is for New Stanton, because that's a, a pretty active area too, because of the branch lines and the locals coming out of it. Then I also have a track for a local yard. And if you look to the right, hand side, you'll see a local yard in the corner. Uh, obviously, um, in, in model railroad, we don't have the depth. We can't put as many tracks across as we want for a yard. So 
I didn't have enough yard trackage. Uh, I guess I could have done something like Scott did and shared tracks, but I think uh, these, these main destinations are going to see a lot of cars on there. It's going to be pretty busy. So I decided to create a small local yard as a sub yard, uh, Akron, Ohio, where the Erie went through, the EL went through. They had multiple yards in that area as well. So it's, it's very prototypical to have some, some other smaller yards in the area. And basically I'll put cars for the local yard on the track in the main yard and they'll get pulled over to that red drill track where an operator will come in and drill that uh, cut of cars and, and set those out into the uh, local yard for Roscoe uh, Industries in Manesson or for the uh, EL or Western Maryland on the Peri Periopolis branch. So definitely a, a very active yard. There'll be two, at least two uh, yard crews work in the main classification yard, a yard master who will double as a hostler. And in, in operation, I'm thinking about having the engineers pick up their trains in the engine servicing facility, come out to the arrival departure tracks and, and couple up to their train. And also when they terminate there to take their train to the engine servicing facility. So there's not gonna be a lot of need for a hostler unless that theory that I'm, the, the, the way I'm planning on operating that area is gonna change. Uh, therefore, I think the yard master can do the few movements during an operating session that would need to be done in the engine servicing area. Uh, just uh, this puts all of the uh, layout onto one screen. I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the operations of the various or the types of various trains I plan on operating. And this is where I'm kind of looking for feedback as well to make sure I'm, I'm running the right things. Uh, but again, east side of Appalachians, we basically have locals coming in. On the west side, we have a lot of activity going on with classification, uh, New Stanton, branch lines, a lot of things to, to take into account. So for the mainline trains, I have at the top of the page, the first uh, two, four, six, seven, or eight are basically trains that are from one end of the layout to the other. They're going from staging to staging. So they're through, they're through freights or they could be TOFC or coal or iron ore, things of that nature. So I've got uh, various through freights going through on the main line to create some, uh, create some traffic also to potentially drop off cars at Manesson. Then I also have from these same destinations, uh, I've got individual trains going from, for example, Chicago, uh, Wheeling, Pittsburgh, Morgantown to Manesson Yard. Wherever you see a red line, that is a freight train that's gonna terminate in Manesson and results in switching for the yard crew. Uh, for the, for the uh, freight train symbols, uh, they'll be based on EL standard practices. Uh, Chicago to Secaucus would be something like CS97. And uh, there is a gentleman, Jim Jarofsky, who has a website and he has all of the trains that the EL ran described with their, with their symbols and what they did, where they went, why they went there. It's really a great website for, a, for an EL modeler like myself. We go to the branch line, local and the transfer trains. On top are the, uh, are the branch line trains, again, Periopolis branch. Uh, these are all freight, uh, New Stanton to Latrobe, Latrobe back to New Stanton. Then we get into the, uh, the locals. Uh, we've got locals leaving Manesson for Roscoe. We've got the Manesson local for industries around the, the yard. We've got New Stanton, which has locals, but again, that'll be, uh, the local industry in New Stanton is gonna be run by the New Stanton operator but there will be locals coming out of New Stanton, as I talked about earlier, going to uh, Youngwood in South Greensburg. Uh, they'll be coming back as turns. There will be one to Greensburg. Uh, we've got locals coming out of the Lancaster staging area, going to Chambersburg in York. And uh, again, Manesson to New Stanton, back to, New, to Manesson will be a transfer. We're gonna have a lot of cars going from the classification yard, I think, up to uh, New Stanton for them to be classified there and, and put into trains. I'm not sure if they'll be done through transfers only or possibly maybe some freights can pick up some cars and, and set them out in, in New Stanton as well. Those are the kind of things I'm looking for some feedback on. Uh, the EL used a variety of terms for their locals. They were called drills, they were called halls or roustabouts. Uh, these trains also had informal nicknames that the crews and operators referred to them by. So I plan on doing all these things that are prototypical with the EL, uh, naming the uh, naming the locals in a, a EL, uh, I guess a specific name that you would see on the uh, timetable, but then also giving them 
nicknames so that the operators can call them by nickname or by their uh, technical EL name. There'll be some interchange trains as well. Uh, obviously, the, as I mentioned earlier in describing the layout, we got the Reading, we got the Western Maryland in a couple, actually three different locations or two different locations, three different types of uh, interchange with them, and also the Pennsylvania Railroad. So I, I've tried to put together, like I said, in my, in my plausibility and, and freelance slide, a, an interesting railroad in terms of operation. You've got trains that are going to be through trains that will circle burn for the mainline. Got, the guys like to run mainline trains. A lot of switching for those who like to switch. There are seven, there are seven distinct uh, switching locations or industrial locations, and I happen to have seven road crews uh, planned for operating the mainline trains in the locals. So each person that comes to operate on a given operating session will have a chance to do switching. And that's, that's one of the things I got from feedback from people is, yeah, it was nice. I ran about four or five trains today, but I didn't get to switch anything. So in designing my layout, I said, I'm gonna make sure that everyone that runs a, a mainline train is gonna have a chance to at least do one switching task during the operating session, at least you know, switch one, one industry. So on the crew positions, I have a dispatcher, traffic center, probably have two people working there as the moles, the Manesson yard master, uh, who will also act as the hostler, the Manesson classification guys, there'll be two switchers there. As I said, seven road crews and the new Stanton operator one. That takes a total of 14 people to operate the layout. Uh, we've got plenty of operators out here who love to run trains, so I, I don't think I'm any problem getting, uh, getting that number. In terms of track authority, I am not an expert here, but over the last uh, month and a half, I've gained a, I've gained a lot of knowledge. Um, you know, prototype operations, they ran freights uh, they had a freight schedule, but it was only really for guidance. They didn't really say that the train had to be out by 3 or 4 p.m. Uh, all the freight trains are run, run as extras. Uh, they employed a variety of track authority systems depending on trackage and volume. So they used TT and TO sparingly on some branch lines. Uh, they basically used mostly ABS and TCS, which was EL's terminology for CTC. So what I'm looking at doing is on the Latrobe branch, I think I'll use TT and TO. Uh, there'll be, like I said, a couple locals out there on that branch and, and the train from Latrobe just might interfere with some of their work. So it'll keep them on their toes. Uh, track warrant, I'll probably start with this method of operation and then I'll add signaling over time. I do want to get to uh, TCS, which I say at the bottom is the desired system for, for mainline operation. And then as far as ABS, I've got approximately 70 feet between sidings. So another question for, for you folks out there, do I divide? That's 70 feet into three or four blocks for prototype protection of opposing trains and closer running of following trains? Or do I just put one intermediate signal in there, which is the approach for the interlockings? Um, you know, putting three or four blocks in, that means that the, it's going to be a 15 to, to 16 foot uh, section of track between signals. That seems kind of excessive on a model railroad. I'm thinking that putting one in between the two interlockings at least lets the operator or the engineer know what's coming up at the interlock and gives them a chance to slow down or, or to uh, you know, get ready to stop. So I'll look for some feedback on, on that from, from you folks as well. I wanna give special thanks to a few people. Uh, Paul Tupacheski, he is an expert on all things Erie Lackawanna. We had the chance to uh, start Interacting with him about uh, a month and a half ago, or maybe maybe uh, a little bit longer than that, I was first introduced to him. But he has really uh, given me a lot of information on the Erie Lackawanna that I would have had to research for probably years to find. Uh, Jim Herzog, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing Eastern Road operations in Pennsylvania to make the the interchanges plausible and just the route, things like that. Uh, Dave Stewart, Doug Geiger, Jim Ferentz, and John Parker, they've provided me the opportunity to operate their layouts and really learn firsthand about railroad operations on, you know, on a model scale. So it's, it's been a great learning curve coming out here to, uh, to Colorado and, and getting a chance to operate on these layouts and, and learn about uh, operations. And finally, to all of you members out there, um, I've come across some, some interesting threads and uh, the responses to my questions has just been great. Uh, you, know, you post a question and, and you expect you get two or three responses, but you, maybe you get 10 or 12 and maybe you get a whole page full sometimes. <laughs> But uh, again, special thanks to everybody out there. I really appreciate it. And uh, questions, comments, and as I hear, not the end.
Um, Doug, thanks so much for presenting. Let me uh, um, flip something over here. All right, so there are a couple, of, we're just gonna go in reverse order. Um, is the EL Southern tier trackage still in place? If so, who is running it? Uh, the EL Southern tier is fictitional. It never existed. Um, the DL and W actually ran up to Buffalo, and that was the extent of their, their main line. If you look at the two railroads, the, the Erie and the DL and W, the DL and W was always financially better off than the uh, Erie. So I mean, it was plausible that they wanted to get to Chicago just like everybody else wanted to. So right. it's a fictional line that the, uh, that the Southern tier represents. Yeah. Uh, let's see, a comment from Jeff Yost. Uh, if Erie and DLW paralleled into, Sh into Chicago, seems to me they would have shared joint trackage from Griffith to state line, just as the CNO did with the Erie. Um, let's see. Uh, any Phoebe Snow Lake Cities and such passenger trains? Yeah, you know, I, I've never been a, a big a big advocate of passenger trains. Um, I, but I've had some conversations uh with paul and some others and they're like you know you gotta you, you gotta throw something in there so i'm looking at putting in uh, at least one east west west east uh main passenger train no, it's 1968 uh a lot of the uh erie lackawanna passenger trains were were, were either gone or very soon yeah. gone. Or dying <laughs> throw a phoebe snow or something like that in there and run yeah. it back and forth on this on the southern tier and i'm thinking about that all right let's see um uh, your route west from York seems a lot like the Newark or the never built South Pennsylvania Railroad, which which much of it today follows the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Um, let's see, there's a question here. Let me see if I can sort this out. Does the mole double ended for dra directional traffic? Yes, the, the mole, the traffic center actually is a continuous loop from the lower level to the upper level. So during an open house or just if I'm shooting pool, I can just circle burn a, a train and not worry about it. Yeah. Uh, let's see, looks like you only classify from the left only. I don't see a way to get right bound trains from the lead to rival. I, I was actually gonna mention the same thing on your, if you go back to your yard diagram. Sure, I can do that. Yeah, so uh, on your west end, you've got that green lead going off to the left that you could use for a, I'm assuming a yard lead, but on the right hand side, there isn't a yard lead. Yes, I, I modified the original drawing and I forgot to put the uh, green line back to the, the yellow yeah. line and that it should connect where that red and, and yellow connect. It's where it got should it, be. Got it, got it. Yeah, it's some, I did sort of the, with my, my main yard, I. I did the arrival, even it's even though it may be sort of an old thing. I like the idea of the arrival departure with the the lead to get down at the into the the ladder. So, okay, uh, let's see. Having the through train set out and pick up at New Stanton and then Monessen will ena enable more fun for through engineers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, if if you run sections, shorter block spacing might allow trains to run tighter to expedite meets. So like first section, second section, I believe he's talking about. Right. And I actually was thinking about it, that's why I brought the question up. Because if you have 70 feet of track between interlocks, how close are you going to actually run two model trains? Um, you know, in the prototype. Well, how, long, how, long is your, how long is your projected train length? I'm looking at about uh, 16 to 20 feet. Okay. So about one third of that 70 feet is taken up by a, by a 20 foot train. Yeah. So, I mean, I think at minimum you've got a whole, you know, 20 to 40 feet between trains, I would think. Okay. But, uh, you know, th and that would be like one block ahead. You know, if you've got them right. like running, you know, red to red, then, um, <laughs> It, I mean, it also depends how many, you know, how, how often that line is blocked. If you've got, you know, if somebody's doing switching, I, I've had very similar designs with what I'm building and the idea of not overlapping blocks vertically, 
Mm -hmm. the, the question is, okay, if somebody is switching in one of those districts, can they get the entire train off the main to do all their switching or are they going to be occupying the main while they're doing their switching? If they're occupying they'll be, they'll the main, be off the main. switching, now you got a whole nother. <laughs> so you can get completely off the main to do all your work? Yes. Uh, okay. There are passing sidings at each of the industrial or areas or towns where a mainline train that, you know, a long train can get off and do its work. And that'll be plenty of room for a local to get in there and, and stop by and do its, its switching as well. Got it. Got it. Um, let's see. Uh, what is your average train length? You said 16 to 20 feet. Uh, ABS is an overlay for TT and TO or TWC. CTC would be separate. Okay. Um, Scott Mech recommends for ABS signaling, I recommend blocks be just long enough for longest train. Better to have two or three blocks between sightings helps local switching crews. Ah, good, good point. I like that. Okay, good. Um, I, I did the same thing. My, my trains are going to be about 11 to 12 feet. My blocks are 15, 16 feet or so, but I've got some oddballs that are shorter than that. So, okay. Um, let's see, for, uh, for intermediate blocks, consider your train length, make blocks a train length or longer. That's, uh, probably average two or three between sightings. Okay. Yep. Um, how long does it take to run end to end? I suspect seven through engineers will not run close enough to worry about closeness between trains. Uh, you said the main line was what, 600 feet? Yeah, 660 feet. So at, at 60 miles an hour, it's 11 minutes. At 30 miles an hour, it's about 22 minutes. So in between, say, 40, 45, it'll be about a 14, 15 minute run. Okay. And like I said, I have seven, seven engineers planned for this lab, but at any given hour, two will be doing locals and there'll be five on the main line doing something. So the train will be spaced out. Uh, John Hansky is asking, are you use, what are you using for the system, CMRI or JMRI? Haven't got that far. I got that far. To that part of the uh, the operation. Got it. Um, just a recommendation: if you want to, if you haven't have a remote thought of doing block detection, cut your blocks while you're laying the track. You don't want to have to go back and retrofit. <laughs> yes, I've had several people tell me that, yep. and yep. that's on the uh, yep. it's on the list. Even if you never put a, sig a single signal on it, it's it's worth the effort to do it up front. Um. Let's see, uh, have an op session before senior, serious scenery work. I've made track changes, improvements after seeing them others operate on my layout. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Kane says, good presentation. I like your term of burning the main for people who just like to run mainline trains for pump, some people that's what they wanna do. The other good thing about mainline trains, we, we've done some uh, if you followed the stuff with remote operations, even in a post COVID world, which we're creeping up on, you could have remote, uh, remote engineers piloting those, those run through trains. Correct. Yeah. So you could even add more, you know, if you really wanted to jam up your layout, get some camera, <laughs> get some of the camera cars to be in front of the trains, mm -hmm. a little bit of zoom, a little bit of, uh, JMRI, and now you've got even more engineers who aren't even in the building. So that's uh, uh, that could be a fun a fun thing. Uh, Ron Burkhart says suggest no more than two 18 foot trains in that 70 feet. Given frequency of trains, it lengthens the runtime and relaxes ops and signaling stress. Okay. Um, I think the other thing that I noticed, and again, I'm I don't claim to be an expert. That 60, I that's my main line is going to be about 400, 400 feet when it's done, including the helix. One of the things you're going to notice is that running the trains at 60 miles an hour is way too, it feels way too fast on a model. Yes. So yes. I, I think slowing it down and basically saying, look, you know, uh, you know, if I'm running flat out, it's going to take six minutes to get from, you know, to do several hundred miles of track. And it's mm -hmm. like, so keep it at a, I think most people tend to run slower who are, who have done any sort of, you know, who have been experienced operators. You always tend to run, I always tend to run slower than maybe I should. 
but that's just me. So correct. And I, I just use the the 60 mile an hour as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One. So I, I plan on running, having a run. I'd like to see people run around 30 to 40 at the at the fastest. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, any regard to booster placement? Maybe a little too early for that, but yeah, I did. You know, I did buy uh, an NC. I got my NCE system already. I've got seven boosters that I bought in addition to the one that comes with the uh, unit. So I've been talking to NCE and also to uh, people like John Park and others who who, who have uh, uh, DCC. And I've learned a lot about uh, about placing them. So I'm going to be putting them around the layout and probably running in each direction. Maybe I think about 30. I think it was like 50 feet to the left, 50 feet to the right from each booster. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm over boostering, but I just want to make sure that I, I, uh, I, I don't have the lines being run too long and get into various signaling issues. Uh, okay. Um, another question, actually, it's one I had as well from Mark Johnson, is how wide is your yard? Because I'm counting tracks there. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That back track is going to be awful hard to reach if you're doing yeah, like two inch spacing. I think it's 30 inches. No, uh, let's see. 8, 16, 18, 22, 24, 26, 28 plus three. It's 31 inches from the from the edge of the lap because I have a four inch uh, okay. security uh, yeah. buff for cars falling off the track. That's a long, I that's mean, hopefully you don't have to get to those back tracks, but that's a long reach. So Well, the, uh, the layouts, the lower level is at 44 inches. And it's surprisingly, I, I want to keep things at 24 inches, 27 inches maximum. Yep. But it's just standing there, I can reach in over all the cars that okay. I have on a piece of styrofoam laid out. And it, there's, it's not a stretch at all, all it's right. easy to, to reach that. All right. It's uh, low does the helper district, no, hold on. Does the helper district run through the helix? Could be problem with watching the, the null point. No, if you look at my screen where it says east end of the yard, the helper district starts, the helper district will start around the local yard and head east up the two and a quarter percent grade to New Stanton. And then once it reaches New Stanton, they'll cut off. So there's there's no helix. Got it. Um, hey, Tom, there's a, in terms of the camera Raspberry Pi, shoot me an email and I'll get you the contact information for the guy in uh, Bob, Bob Rodriguez in, in Virginia is doing some of the really cool remote operation stuff. Okay. Um, that was a, one of the comments here. So, all right. Well, I guess, do you have any, do you have any, that's kind of all of the comments in here. Do you have any questions for the group? Anything that you wanted specific feedback on? I mean, we're kind of over our five o'clock mark, but we've still got lots of people. So if you have uh, specific questions. I, I got some good feedback. I've, I've jotted down notes and I probably would have questions, but like I said, over the last couple of weeks, uh, Paul and, and others have just been invaluable in helping me uh, understand my layout better and, and put this presentation together. So uh, a lot of answers were, were, a lot of questions were answered prior to this presentation. Yeah. So One other thing I'll throw out, and again, this may just be, I, I built a great big yard without really knowing what I was gonna use it for. Mm -hmm. um, but then as I've been figuring out, okay, when I've got run through trains or if I've got local, where do the locals get served from? Mm -hmm. my, my model is I've got manifest freights that essentially move cars between yards. Okay. Locals work out of the yards. And that's just kind mm -hmm. of the, the pattern I'm following. Once I went through and figured out, okay, these, these various uh, switching districts, kind of how many, how many, places do I need? How many cars can I manage? That's helped me figure out, okay, you know, did I size my yard right? Do I need more? Um, you know, for instance, you, your idea about the third level branch line, I'm doing the same thing, except I'm going low. Mm -hmm. I'm going under my peninsula, which will be at about 18 inch, which lets somebody sit and switch. Um, okay. You've got people who can't stand. So that seemed like a nice way to not only get some more running room, but uh, uh, provide a seated. But what I was trying to figure out is like, okay, do I take the local cars down the helix and park them? But after doing some math, I figured out, well, I can just run the locals out of the main yard for that area. Um, 
and then basically the local will leave the main yard, go down the helix to the, the branch line, do its work, and then come back. That was okay. just something I figured out so that I'm not, and the same thing with the other couple of yards I've got. It's like, okay, I've got enough space here to handle this many cars. I can run locals to this district and this district from here. This other district will need to be served from another spot. That was just something I kind of went through. Uh, like I said, mine is a bit smaller than yours, but I've been I've been going through some of the same the same discussions in my own head about how do I want it to work. So again, not yeah. criticizing, just it, it's very similar, you know, mental discussion I've been having with myself. So yeah, I, I think once I actually put together the train list of the mainline trains, the locals, and the transfers, and the and the interchanges that really shored up what the yard trackage needed to be and how I was going to use it. That's yeah. where it came and came together. Yeah. You start justifying, why do I, you know, I've got all these tracks because I wanted a big yard. I love having big switching yard. And now I've got a justification for having in my, in my personal case, but. Right. Same um, with me. Exactly. There was a comment here about how do locals gain easy access to the main. Um, I think we figured out that your arrival, to your, your, plan didn't have the well so well for the locals, so at the local yard you can see there's two blue tracks those are arrival departure yards for locals they're actually it's actually departure yard for the locals because they're going to come off of those blue tracks and they can hit the main in either direction locals coming back to manesson will actually go to the main classification yard because i'm guessing most cars in a local train are not going to stay local they're going to go east west to Secaucus, Lancaster, Chicago, Wheeling, yeah. Pittsburgh, you know, they're going to go somewhere else other than the local layout area. Right. You're probably not taking cars from Roscoe to Monessa more than likely, right? Oh, yes. Car from one local right, to another. Exactly. So true. I mean, cars from Roscoe will go back to the Monessa yard and they'll get classified because most of those cars are going to end up going, like I said, east, east or west outside of the layout. Oh, area. I meant, uh, just looking at your four local yard de destinations. Okay. The idea that a car coming in, you know, a car coming from Roscoe is probably not going to Periopolis, is it? Exactly. It's, it's okay. not going to go back to Roscoe. No. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 No, it's the car card or whatever system I use will, will make it go somewhere else. Got it. Uh, for your boost. Yeah. This is a, this is a good comment for your booster districts. Consider the number of local motives that will be operating in the district at one time, including idle locomotives. You may want to have a single booster for MMS and by itself. Given the complex trackage, I would, I, I've heard the same thing. We had, you know, one yard, the main yard gets a booster all to itself. Yes, and uh, uh, John Parker has a, a large yard in his layout and he's got several, uh, several booster districts. You know, he's got the main line separated from the classification tracks, from the engine facility, et cetera. So everything's broken down. So if you do have a derailment or something, it's not going to shut the whole yard down. Yeah, he's got that amazing BNSF layout, right? The yes. Fall, Fall River. Oh, yes. I still want to operate on that someday. Okay. Well, um, like I said, I think we, hopefully this has been helpful for you. I appreciate you putting it, putting your presentation together. Everybody is full of ideas for, for layouts. I think we've got so many different different types of layouts out there so many different types of I, I like your comment about you've got different things for different people's preferences right that that's a big thing you, you can't do i i've operated on sessions where the only thing you had was a circle burn right you went from staging to staging with no switching mm -hmm. i've been on everything is switching there's nothing there's no train running the layout there's you know there's always this I, I like the idea of having a mix of things because everybody's got different preferences. And, you know, if you, you know, somebody, will, especially if you've got people wanting to learn, right? Okay, well, you start them on, you know, if I go to a new layout, well, I want to see the layout. I want to run the whole thing. And then I'll come do some switching or I'll work a yard or I'll do something else. But, you know, people who are brand new, well, you don't probably want them switching. You want them you know, getting used to following traffic directions, looking at signals, following TT and TO. So I think the idea that you've got there about having that variety, I think that's, I mean, that's person, that's my ideal personally. So that's what I'm planning to do as well. To, so. to me, model railroading is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a fun experience. So I'm trying to create that fun experience for people. Exactly. 
So um, again, thanks so much for presenting. Um, and with that, I'm going to, let's see. Uh, oh, hold on. Let's go ahead and stop the recording here.